Hi there. Welcome back or welcome for the first time to Pin Cut Sew. I'm Nikki. Today I have a backlog of things that I have been needing to finish. I'm not the kind of person who likes who likes to have a pile of unfinished projects laying around. I don't have space for that in my sewing room and I just I'm, I'm a finisher. I really like to finish things. I'm either going to scrap it all together or I'm just going to finish it. But for some reason right now I have kind of a list of a few things that I just need to finish. One of them is this baby quilt. Do you see it? I made this sort of on a whim. I was just in a quilting mood. Quilting is really therapeutic for me. And I just, baby quilts are low pressure because they're small. Um, I needed to use up some scraps and I wanted to play with this giant log cabin design that I would sort of been wanting to try. So I made this pink and green scrappy baby quilt and I finally quilted it last week. And now I'm finally going to bind it. I actually made this quilt top before we moved, but it was right before we moved. So I feel like I have a good excuse for not finishing it right away. Also, I don't actually have a baby in mind to give this to. I do know some people who one just had a baby and one's about to have a baby and they're both boys. And this is a really girly quilt. So what I'm going to do is finish this and then I'm going to list it in my Etsy shop today. So if you want to go grab this quilt from my Etsy shop, it can be yours. And I will update the description once it's sold. But I have a method of quilt binding. I actually demonstrated this method in my one of my most popular videos, which is for the oversized hot pad pattern. I mean, tutorial. So this quilt binding method is the way that I've always done it. It's how I learned to do it. I don't remember how I learned. I'm sort of a self-taught quilter. My mom was a quilter, but I learned in my 20s. Um, just from books and things. And so I don't know how I learned this, but I put this method, especially the way that I join the two ends together and the way that I do the corners. I've never been called a genius so many times in my life as in the comments on that video. And it's because of that binding method. So this is my no fuss quilt binding method. I hope you enjoy it. In that other video, it's a machine only method. So you sew the binding onto the back of the quilt, flip it around to the front and top stitch on your machine. And I like to do that in small projects like those hot pads and like the, um, the coasters, things like that. Anything small. But on actual quilts, I like how it looks better when I hand stitch the binding to the back. So the final step I'm going to do here will be the hand stitch method. But I will tell you along the way how to do the machine method too. If you're someone who has pain in your hands or arthritis or you're just in a hurry, or you absolutely hate hand sewing, like it's a bad word, then I'll try to make sure that I tell you what to do if you're doing that method too. All right, let's get started. Okay, I have my binding fabric picked out already. This is just something I had enough of and is already in the quilt a little bit. So, whoops. Oh gosh, my table is such a mess. I'm going to put that aside for a minute. I'm going to cut strips from this binding fabric after I iron it. I'm going to cut them two and a half inches wide and I'm going to cut enough. I sort of, I don't have like an exact science for measuring how much binding I need. I just, sometimes I just lay the quilt out and then cut enough strips and drape it around the quilt and guess. But in this case, my quilt is 37 inches on each side. And so that times four, and then I just add like 20 because that's going to be plenty. So what I need is about four and a half feet, I mean yards of binding. So let me go iron this real quick. Okay, so I'm going to cut the entire from selvage to selvage two and a half inch strips. This edge seems pretty straight already. So first I will neaten this edge. Let's see, my fabric is 45 inches wide. And if I need four and a half yards, it seems like five strips will do the trick. Okay, cut five strips. I can always cut more if my math was wrong. So now that we've cut our strips, we need to join them all together. So they are one long strip. I'm going to place this strip here. You can cut off your selvages if you want to, or if you need to have a straight line because yours isn't straight, then cut that off. But I'm just going to leave them for now. They will get cut off later. So you'll want to place your strips at right angles like this. 
And then you're going to make a line. You need to leave at least enough overhanging, at least a quarter inch. I'm leaving more than that because I want to cut these selvages off. My iron is making so much noise. I don't know why. Then we're going to draw a line from here to here. Okay, this will not work if you go this way. So this inner corner and this outer corner, it needs to be these two corners. And place a pin. Check to make sure it's going to be a strip, that you're not pinning it the wrong way. And then I'm just going to go stitch on my line. Okay, now that I've stitched it, I can go ahead and cut it off. I have a quarter inch ish from my drawn line. I'm going to go ahead and cut off those dog ears too. So then I have joined them diagonally. The reason you do it diagonally is just to reduce bulk when you're stitching it on. Although in some cases it is a design choice to join them straight, especially if you're making a really scrappy binding. I think it can look really neat when they're straight. I have done that a few times. Okay, so here's my next one. And just make my line from here to here, not this way, not the center corner, but this way. I'm going to keep joining my strips like this until they're all connected. Okay, now I'm going to go over to my ironing board. I actually am going to cut off my selvage edges. And I'm going to press this in half all the way down. You might be wondering why I did not cut bias binding. I think maybe a lot of beginners think you have to use bias binding for quilts, but you don't unless your quilt has curved edges. So if you have curved the corners or if you're doing like a scalloped edge on your quilt, or you can if you want to, if you're using like a, um, a gingham or something or stripes that look neater diagonal, then you can cut it on the bias, but otherwise we're just doing straight edges so it can just be cut on the straighter grain. Okay, so I'm going to go press this in half, starting at the right or, or the rightmost end. I'm going to press it in half all the way to the other end, but when I get to this other end, I'm going to press it. First, I'm going to press a corner up like this, and then I'm going to finish pressing it so it will look like this. This is key to the finishing I was talking about in the end. Okay, my binding is made. So on the right side, it's just straight. And I also realized as I was ironing that I didn't tell you, when you come to a seam, press the seam flat and then fold it over and press. And then on this end, I have this sort of pocket I created with a triangle, folded it up with the raw edge up, and then raw edge to meet. So I have this little pocket here. Okay, so now we're gonna start sewing it onto our quilt. Make sure you have your walking foot on your sewing machine. I just made a video about the walking foot, how to use it, how to install it, why you definitely need one, especially for quilting. Um, so you can, that was two videos ago, so you can go watch that if you need help with this or don't know how to install it. So I'm gonna go put this on my machine and then I'm going to pick a spot. Now, if you're making your machine only binding, so remember I was telling you that method where you only, you finish it by machine. I'm going to finish mine by hand, so I'm going to put my binding on the, on the front. But if you're finishing it by machine, you want to do this whole thing on the back. So you would start on the back. So then you can turn your binding around to the front. But I'm going to start on the front. I'm going to start on the green side for no reason at all. Okay, I'm going to use the triangular side of my binding, the one that I folded a pocket into. I'm going to place it sort of somewhere in the middle. And I'm going to pin it about six inches from where this pocket is. This is where I'm going to start sewing. So this is going to stay flappy until I come back around, and then I'll show you what to do with that. This is the same if you're going to do it if you're sewing onto this side, same method. And then when I get to this corner, I'm going to go sew this on with a quarter inch seam. When I get to this corner though, I'm going to stop sewing a quarter inch from the raw edge here. And I'm gonna back stitch. I don't pin my binding on because it tends to stretch out as you sew. And then if you pivot, and then if you've already pinned the whole thing, then it's just distorted anyway and you have to undo. 
So I just guide it along with my fingers, lining it up as I go, and I'm going to stop sewing a quarter inch before this next seam, this next edge. Okay, so I have sewn my first side, well, part of the side. <laughs> this is still gonna be floppy till the end. This part, I am now going to, so some quilt tutorials will have you sort of miter this corner and sew it weird and there's math involved and it's a little bit overkill in my opinion. <laughs> so this is how I learned. You fold this up like so, so it's at a 90 degree here, creating a perfect angle here. And then you fold it back down here so that the folded edge is flush with this raw edge. So let me show you again. You fold it up as an angle here. So I have a 45 degree angle here. And then I'm going to fold it back down so that my raw edge, my folded edge is flush with this raw edge. I'm gonna put a pin there. And now I'm going to go sew, start at the very edge, a quarter inch seam all the way to the other end and do the same thing stopping a quarter inch before my next raw edge. Okay, my next side is done. I went a little bit too far because I pushed the wrong button. <laughs> so we'll take some of that out. Okay, I backstitched far enough so that it wouldn't, I wouldn't have to go redo. Okay, so I'm gonna do the same thing on this next side and then on the next one. And then when we get back around to the folded piece of binding, I will then show you what to do with that. So. Let me show you this one more time and then I'm going to go finish. So I'm going to fold this up to a 45 degree angle, sort of finger press it if you want, and then fold it back down so that the pressed edge is meeting the raw edge. Then on this other side, if you don't push the wrong button, I just like to put a pin in the quarter inch mark because when my binding is covering it and I'm sewing, I don't, I can't see where the end of it is. So I just make sure I stop where my pin is and then backstitch. Thank you. Okay, I stopped short of where my two pieces will meet. I made an entire whole strip too much of binding. So you know what I like to do is I roll these bindings up and I keep them in my ribbon drawer. Whenever something, like I'm making a coaster that needs just a little bit of binding or like the neckline of a shirt, I already have so many cute bindings made. Okay, so I stopped short of where my two ends will overlap. Lay this one out as if you had sewn it. You can pin it if you want or clip. And then this one, I'm going to cut off about just under an inch away from where this pocket is. Then I can simply open up my pocket and place my other end inside of it. I'm going to continue sewing my binding on and this end will get sewn right into this pocket. So a lot of binding methods will have you take it off the machine, open out both ends, somehow math your way into making a corner here, <laughs> and then it's miraculously supposed to fit back. Whenever I have tried that method, I didn't get it right, and I didn't see the point when this method is so easy. So um, this is how I always do it, and it looks beautiful from both sides, and it's just a really seamless finish without the fuss. So let me go finish.
Okay, voila. You can barely even see it on the video, I bet. There is my perfect finished binding. Okay, so let's finish sewing this onto the other side. So if you have sewn it onto the back because you want to, to top stitch it by machine from the front, then you have seen me in other videos. I have sewn a zigzag stitch along this um, inside of the seam allowance because it helps everything lay flat. Because when you're trying to fold it over and sew it by machine, it is more difficult somehow to get it to get everything flat enough for you to really pull this over and get it straight and smooth the whole time. So for smaller projects that I'm gonna machine stitch the binding onto, that's what I always do is put a zigzag stitch in, in this seam allowance. But I'm not gonna do that here. For bigger projects that I'm gonna hand sew onto the back, I just leave it as is and I don't seem to have any problem at all. So this is the hand sewing part. I'm going to flip it over. I'm going to pick a spot to start. I don't like to start right on my joined binding. You can clip or pin if you want to. I don't usually. I'm going to thread a needle. I'm going to try to have the thread matching my binding color. Okay, this green will do. I'm going to cut quite a long length of it. I can't find my thimble, guys. I looked everywhere. Oh well. Okay, so I have threaded a needle. I'm going to start hand stitching. There are a few different methods of doing this. Don't I like to just start in the binding so that when I come back around, I can bury that tail in there. Then you're just going to stitch your binding down as invisibly as you can. So underneath the binding, I grab some of the quilt. And then I grab a teeny piece of the binding itself. And I, I fold it over to the wrong side as I go. So nothing shows from the front. And you have tiny stitches showing from the back. I get the feeling some people think hand sewing is not as strong and sturdy as machine sewing, which might be true in some cases, but I've been using the quilts I've made for well over a decade. <laughs> I have quilts my mom made with this method when I was young. Never had a binding come apart. I have had other things happen, like cheap fabrics pulling apart at the seams. So that's something to think about. I've never had a binding come off. Okay, so let me sew to this first corner so I can show you how to deal with the corner. And then I'm gonna make myself comfortable and finish this. Okay, I'm approaching my corner. I found my thimble. I really like these soft, squishy kind. My other favorite is leather, but they tend to stretch out and fall off eventually. This one I really like, so I'll link you to that in the description. Okay, when you come over this corner, and this is the same, if you're doing this by machine, then this will be the front of your quilt and you'll be folding this over and you will just simply be stitching. You'll be edge stitching it down. So from the front, your stitching will be right on this binding edge. From the back, it will not be perfect, but that's fine. If you want more of a tutorial on the machine method, then go watch that hot pad video. Otherwise it is the same, even the corners. So when you come to a corner, you're going to first fold it. So this is at a 45 degree angle. Kind of press it with your fingers and then fold it back on itself so that you have a 45 degree angle here. I put a pin exactly in that corner and then I continue sewing with my needle. Until I can get my needle right into that corner. Oops, okay. So I'm catching both pieces of my binding. And there I have a perfect mitered corner on both sides. See, fuss free, fuss free quilting, I'm a fan. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna make myself comfortable and finish.
Okay, I'm on my last length of thread. Here's my joined part, so you can't even see. Just blends in with all the other joins. I'm going to show you at the very end how I bury my tails. I think all in all, this didn't even take me a full hour. I think that's another misconception about hand sewing is that it's slow. But it's really not. I always just put on a TV show or listen to a podcast or music or just chat with my family. <laughs> I even took my break, took a break to make my daughter a sandwich. Also, I have these, you may have seen in that clip, this around the neck. This is a light, a book light. See? Um, comes in all it comes in several colors. I bought one for my mom because she was doing hand embroidery once and she loved it so much that I then bought myself one. I do use it for reading. I also use it when I'm waiting for my kids and it's dark outside, like I'm sitting in the car. Is anyone else in that phase of life? But it's really, really useful also for hand stitching, especially if you're watching a movie with your family and nobody wants all the lights on so you can see what you're doing. It's very useful, so I'll link this in the description below. It's been my one of my favorite gadgets I've ever had. Okay, so I'm back around to where I started. I shoved my tails in, those beginning tails, and here's how I bury my tails when I finish a length of thread, too. Just keep going. Gonna knot once. And twice. And then I'm just going to, I'm making sure I'm not going through to the other side. I'm just kind of burying it within the batting layer and then I can snip it close. Okay, my quilt is done. It's really pretty. I'm going to wash it so it's nice and crinkly and then I'm going to add it to my Etsy shop. I'll show you what it looks like after I crinkle it too. Mm -hmm.